It's awesome. Beautiful. Yes. I like to um, encourage our young people to, to learn music. I, I wish that we could get a piano teacher like we used to have before COVID. Um, she was particularly susceptible to that, the teacher that we had, and she used to come over every week. And I'd say most of the students in the school took lessons from her. And you could tell at Christmas time when they would get up to play that they were really making good progress. So we're proud of our young people that have had lessons and know how to handle the ivories. <laughs> I also like to say that I endorse what Don Reed was trying to do, that some of you that uh, would like to come out with him around, it's on the other side of the airport, I think. Um, I wasn't out here to hear it all. Um, in New Bern, we're giving out, we have 2,500 uh, uh, Great Controversy books, and I think they're down to about 1,000 of them left. So they're going out as I went out with them. And there's a lot more explanation to do. Isn't that right, Don? You don't have to do that. You just say free book and they take it. Isn't that right? Somebody asked me what it was about, and I said, well, it's about the history of religious freedom. And I think that's pretty accurate. I was preparing to preach a sermon encompassing four entities which deserve our gratitude. They all deserve our respect and acknowledgement, and it was my intent to speak on all four today. But it didn't take long for me this week to be overwhelmed with the material, which began as one message, soon became four. The first is what we owe God. And that's what we're going to look at today. The second is what we owe his body, the church. The third is we ourselves. And the fourth and last is what do we owe the world? And over the next few weeks, that's going to become our standard fare as we delve into this message. The first, as it must be, is always about God himself. Do we owe God anything? <laughs> Thank you. We owe him everything, don't we? We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Life on planet Earth wouldn't have lasted this long if it wasn't for him. We wouldn't have the direction in our lives. And I could go on and on and on. We owe God a lot. The first thing that we owe him for is being the creator. It's a precious thing to think of God as the creator because he created all things. He surely did. Without his gift of creation, nothing would exist in fact, the Bible begins with, in verse chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God did what? He created the heaven and the earth. You know, you've got to love the way the Bible opens, don't you? It gets right down to it. It's right there. In fact, there'd be no meaning or significance to our major one of our major beliefs that's engra engraved on that sign out there, seventh day, tells you all you need to know as to whether we believe in a creator God. I don't believe that, that evolution is an explanation of origins. It's an excellent um, dynamic in biology in that in limited ways, it works. Look around this room. How many different kinds of people do we have here? How many skin tones? How much, how our eye, color our eyes are, our hair, our facial features? All of that 
is a part of the glory of God. He created this world with two people. And then it went on exponentially. And I can't even guess how many people there were before the flood. But after the flood, how many were there? There were eight. It didn't take very many generations for those descendants of those eight to build the Tower of Babel and to resist the will of God. I don't know. My heart goes out to God. You know, he puts up with enough from me. But when I think about what goes on in this world, you know, a lot of people on the street hate God or disbelieve him deliberately. You know why that is, don't you? Because you say that God is love, and yet look at all this misery in this world. I'll explain that to you shortly. The reason he created it is the same reason that he allows us to sin. In 1 John 4, verse 8, we read, God is love. If that's true, you don't have to love him. You don't have to love him. You can hate him or ignore him. That's mainly what's going on in the world. I think you're well aware of that. Because love requires not only creation itself, but the choice not to obey the creator. If you don't have the freedom to say no, the freedom to say yes is meaningless. Let that roll over a couple of times. That's the reason. That's the answer. One of the things that uh, we get from creation other than our existence is the diversity of living things that God made for us that he made before us. We came at the end of creation week. What was God doing in the days prior? What were the five days about? Well, he separated the darkness from the light, didn't he? He did. He, he, he uh, took what was a chaotic... Uh, mass in space and divided the water from the land. You know, one of the most amazing experiences I ever had when we lived in Miami was to go down to Keep His Cane. And they have a, um, a sea life park there. And I always enjoyed seeing those where they had the dolphins and the, and the uh, different animals, some of them trained. Um, but there was also something very, very interesting. Um, there was a program that you could go into. It was a kind of a, I'm not sure what you'd call it, but it was a kind of an experience type of thing where there were sounds that were unexpected that came from different directions, where there were pictures. What this program did, I think it was called Planet Ocean. That's what it was, Planet Ocean. And it's, it struck me because they started with our solar system. They went to the sun. Then they went all the way out on the edge of the universe, at Pluto. And they went through all the different uh, planets that are in our solar system. By the way, how many of them can be inhabited? One. Now, you can have an astronaut that maybe get on Mars, but you can't breathe the air. They have an air, but it's toxic. You have to wear equipment to be able to breathe. Not only that, but it's, a, it's so far away, it takes you years to get there. See, we can't move by the speed of light. And the speed of light is slow compared to God. And they went through all of these, and some of them were gaseous. Uh, they just had all these gases on it and that were being confined by gravity. 
Some of them were just rocks like our moon. Just rocks stuck up there. Now, the moon play, plays a role, doesn't it? It plays a role for us being able to be in balance and for the curvature, not the curvature, but the direction of the earth is related to the moon and the tides, all of that. So God probably made the moon about the same time that he threw everything else up there. But it's fascinating to think about because as they went from one to another, Saturn's always interesting. It's got those big bands around it. Um, but as we went from one to the other, it was a, a sequence of devastation. It was a sequence of unfinishedness. And it was quite obvious as they got closer and closer and closer to Earth. Let me say this. Earth is prettier than any of the other planets. What do you see when you see Earth from, planets, uh, from, from outer space? You've seen the pictures. What is there here that there isn't anywhere else? Water. And an atmosphere that protects us from a lot of things flying around out there at random. And when the Earth was new, it also had a special atmosphere that we don't have any longer. A lot of that water fell on the flood as well as water that was under the earth that came up. And you, I have no reason to believe that the oceans um, or the large bodies of water that existed before uh, the flood were not, were not salty. I think the salt came in after the flood. I think it broke open the, the salt vaults under the earth and they came up and and now that helps us. What did that help accomplish for one thing? It made fresh water very, very special. You know that we have more water, fresh water in North America than any other place in the world? The Great Lakes are the biggest contiguous um, uh, link of fresh water in the whole world. Tell me this, this country and this, this hemisphere haven't been blessed. They said, if, if, from our viewpoint, if time should last, when we get into the next century, that water is going to be the scarcest, fresh water is going to be scarce. And it's going to be like oil is now in its value. I remember when they first came out with, with these little bottles, I said, nobody's going to buy water. <laughs> Why pay, pay water, money for water, when you can go over to the tap and you can get it? Is that right, Lola? <laughs> and I've already had a couple of swallows of this. I wish I had them that week that I could hardly get my breath. Remember that? Yeah. I never had an experience like that before. Mm. There's something special about this earth. God made all the others, too. And their location in the solar system is important because there's a balance of gravity between all these different planets that helps ours to be right where it is and to stay right where it is. Now, we don't, it doesn't sit still. The center of our solar system is obviously the sun, right? But we move around the sun in a year, 365 and a quarter days. But we don't move around in a circle. We move around in an ellipse. It's elliptical. Now, I'm not enough of a physicist to be able to tell you all the ins and outs of that and the significance of it. But we live in a very special place because of our Creator Amen. who made it. Nature itself is an example of diverse living things, plants, animals. You know, this is interesting. About I'm not going to get into it and debate it today, although we should take care of our environment. Um, there are some that are coming to believe that what we're going through is a cycle rather than something that's self-imposed so much. 
when it comes to nature, when it comes to the environment. But you know, I was reading, I can't remember who it was, it was a well-known, um, I think it was, oh, I can't quite, can't quite be sure. But one of the great physicists and, and weather scientists in the world uh, commented on a lot of this. And um, he said, the greatest thing that we can do to take care of the environment with all the things that they say that fossil fuels do is to plant more trees. Instead of that, we cut them all down. You know what trees are, don't you? They are machines that breathe in what we breathe out. And they breathe out what we need to breathe in. God put it all together. Now, the fact that it doesn't work so well has to do with who? Us, a lot of it, and, and also as people, and also as the evil one who hates whatever God made. Of course, God made him. I wonder if he hates himself. I don't know. That's another sermon. I don't know if I'm equipped to preach it. Plants, animals, elements, the mountains, the oceans. In Psalm 33, verse 6 to 9, we read, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done, and he commanded, and it stood fast. That was the psalmist's view. And in Psalm 19, verse 1, The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. For God makes things as an extension of his very self. He risks all for love. That's what he's doing, you know. He's risking everything for love. And you're a part of it. And I'm a part of it. You wouldn't be taking your time to come here today if you were totally disinterested, if you had no relationship with the Almighty, if you weren't tuned in with what He made and how beautiful it can be. The parts of the world and the things that happen in the world are often ugly because we said no when God asked us to love him. I read from Psalms 103, 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Count them. Who forgiveth all of our iniquities? Who healeth all our diseases? Who redeems our lives from destruction and who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfieth our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like an eagle's? You know, that's, I like that. The older I get and the more things I can't do like I used to do, I'm going to get them back. It's coming back. God never designed us to grow old and to, and to become afflicted and to be in pain and at last to die. That's not his purpose for his creation. But God is more than a creator. He's also a seeker. He always makes the first move. You can see it all the way through the Bible. I don't have the time to even list them all for you, but I can throw a few out there shortly. In John Stott's book, Basic Christianity, he said this, The Bible reveals a God who long before it even occurs to man to turn to him 
while man is still shrouded in darkness and sunk in sin. And he takes the initiative. He rises from his throne. He lays aside his glory and stoops to seek until he finds us. That's the character of the God that the Bible reveals. In Genesis 2 verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where was he? He was hiding under a fig bush, wasn't he? He was trying to cover his nakedness. He wasn't naked before, although they didn't have clothes at that point. I guess God invented that when he took the life of sheep and fashioned garments for Adam and Eve to cover the nakedness that embarrassed them when there was no embarrassment in righteousness and peace. Think about Noah's message. For 120 years, he bore the burden of preaching to the antediluvian world, and none of them were interested. None of them were interested. But Noah's family was saved in the ark. That's, if, if you had to pick out who you wanted to be saved at a time like that, you would want your family. That's pretty slim pickings, folks, for God. God is all-powerful, true. But he puts a governor, if you will, on his actions. He holds back because he loves. He gives opportunity for repentance. But most people don't want repentance. Most of them are heading over a cliff of eternal darkness and they won't listen think of Abraham okay he, entered, he, he came from two all the way up to eight now there came a time when there was only one family there was only one family in which there was any knowledge of the Creator God at all. And they were idolaters. Terah and his son Abram. God came to them. Get thee out of thy country and unto a land that I will show thee. And so they left civilization. They went out to the Hindus hinterlands and he spent his entire life living in a tent when God said I'm going to give you this land the only thing that he owned is what he bought when he bought the cave of Machpelah where he buried his wife where he was buried and later where Joseph was buried because he, he required that the children of Israel would carry him and bury him with his fathers in that cave One, there was one family that survived the flood. Here's another family because his half-sister and his father came with him and then Sarah became his wife. People often ask, where did people come from? Adam and Eve's day. Where do you think they came from? There weren't sisters mentioned, but there had to be. There are some things that only make sense. Why is it wrong to marry close relatives because of DNA problems that we have today, primarily? But back then it was very different. They were closer to creation. You know, the servant of the Lord tells us there was almost no sickness on the face of the earth until Abraham's day. Think about that. Think of the immune system that they had. Think of the intelligence that they had. Oh, that was used for evil, only evil continually in the antediluvian world. And later at the Tower of Babel, they used it again. They were pushing it in God's face. We're going to find a way where we can survive without you, God. We'll have a tower that will go up to the clouds. 
Well, after God let them do that for a while, but eventually he said, I'm shutting this thing down. We come to the time of Jacob. He had, he had stolen his brother's birthright. He should have let God take care of it. This whole thing about the eldest son and so forth is, is I, I guess that was tradition. But it often didn't work that way. Was Jacob the oldest? No, he was the younger. Was Joseph the oldest in Jacob's family? No. The oldest in Jacob's family was a problem, and it could not be trusted. Then we come to the time of Moses. How did, oh, I haven't finished with Jacob yet. Yeah, we came to the, uh, to the dream that he had on his way up to his uncle Laban's. And what, what did he see? Somebody tell me. He had a dream. He had a vision. And what did he see? There was something connected in heaven and earth. The ladder. There were angels going up and down right to him. Now what does Jesus tell us? He's the ladder. He's the one that connects heaven and earth. Later on, he wrestled with one who injured him to save his life. You know, Esau was on his way with his army and his weapons. And he was ready to kill Jacob for what he'd done all those years before. But how did, how did Jacob appear to go and meet his brother? He had a crutch. He was limping. He was injured from what that heavenly being did to him. By the way, we know, uh, not from Genesis, but from uh, the rest of the Old Testament, I didn't write that text down, that it tells him he saw God face to face. Who was that that was wrestling with him? It was the pre-incarnate Christ. That's who it was. You go back to the Old Testament. It doesn't tell you this is who they are. But you find them here and there and elsewhere, all over the place. God coming to sinners, approaching them, and giving them a message of hope. Then we find Moses. How did Moses get back to Pharaoh? Because Moses was encountered by a voice from a burning bush said that he was the almighty I am that I am tell him I am has sent you then we come to the time of Joshua right after Moses he was on the eve of doing something with Jericho he didn't know what and then he encountered one who identified himself as the captain of the Lord's host he had armor on, and he had a sword in his hand. And who do you suppose that was? Who was the captain of the Lord's host? Come on, that's an easy one. The second member of the Holy Trinity, undoubtedly. And he gave a strategy to Joshua by which God would perform a miracle. If they would do what he told them to do, he would take care of the walls of Jericho. And didn't he? All the walls came down except that one sliver that was standing where Rahab and her family were. Oh, the Old Testament is so much fun when you know what it means from the New Testament. How about David? He was the greatest of Israel's generals and kings. Was he the firstborn of Jesse? No. No. In fact, when the prophet came to anoint the next king of Israel, he went through all the sons of Jesse and could not find one upon whom the Lord had approved. And he said, isn't there another? And so they called David in from the fields and the flocks, and he anointed him. 
and made him king. You got to love the way God works. And then we come to the word, the concept of the word. Originally, an understanding of the Almighty was passed from father to son. They had brains that were sharp and 100% able to recall. Can you imagine what it would be like to have that? There's not a, there's not a, there's not a test that's been devised by mankind that those people would have been able to top out on. But Moses was the first to write the Bible. He wrote it down. And we call it the Pentateuch, the five books. That which had been vocalized to the few could now be revealed to the many. Inside that is the Ten Commandment Law. Exodus 20, verses 3 through 17. God's will for mankind in all seasons and to all people. The Ten Commandments are eternal. They come from God himself. Not a prophet. Not somebody that heard something that then relays it on, but from God's own hand he shaped it. Do you remember when Steve Vail was here last year? What did he say, say those tables were made of? Sapphire. Sapphire, taken from the throne of God. And he had the scriptural proof. Could that be something temporary? I don't believe it is. Oh, but nine of them are permanent. But not one of them. The one that God asked to remember. Isn't that... Isn't that cute? He clothes his thoughts in words and acts. The exodus from Egypt is a type of the coming of Christ. And we're going to get there in a few minutes. It's a type. Five of the seven plagues at the end of time come from the ten in Egypt. And I, I hate to disagree with those that think that we're going to get raptured out of here before the trouble comes. No, we won't. Psalms 91 tells us not to worry about it. A, fall, a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh you. Where was Israel when the plagues fell? Right there in Egypt. But when they took a cup of water, it was water. When an Egyptian took a cup of water, all of a sudden it turned to blood. Which would you rather be? Then there's the living word, the, the logos, if you will. In Isaiah 55, verse 9, his thoughts are as much higher than our thoughts as the heavens are higher than the earth. The incarnate word. Where does John begin his gospel? In the beginning was the word. Now how did God create the world? Words. There's only one thing that he didn't use in creating this earth other than the breath of his mouth was Adam and Eve. He made Adam from the dust of the earth and Eve from his rib. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This moves us to the fourth entity. 
the Savior. In Genesis 3, 15, we get the first promise. At the gates of the Garden of Eden, as Adam and Eve had been expelled, an angel with a flaming sword was placed at the gate so that people could not take of the tree of life and continue being sinners. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, that's the devil, serpent, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That is the promise of the deliverer. This is the first gospel promise. And Paul mentions it, mentions this promise in Romans 16, verse 20. This is fun. This is fun. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Somehow I'd missed that about crushing Satan under our feet. And then John 3.16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is a savior. Jesus was the second member of the Holy Trinity, still is and always will be. But one thing's different. He forever and always gave up one of the attributes of deity because he will always be flesh and blood like you and me. His body is not going to be beautiful. It's going to be ordinary. Isn't that what Isaiah told us? Because man looks on the outward appearance, but where does God look? Right here. Because God is love. And I like verse 17. A lot of people don't read verse 17 of John 3.16. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The purpose of Jesus' coming was to save sinners and open heaven's gate to all who will receive him. In 1 John 1, 1.9 we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How is that possible? John the Baptist explains it to us when he saw Jesus. He publicly hailed him, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is the meaning of the cross. I'm going to have to skip some things here. What if I tried to teach all four of these things to you today? What would that, where would that take us? Still about three in the afternoon? I don't know. I apologize for running over a little bit. Our service started slightly late. What about the inheritor of all these things that God has made and that he will do? In Genesis in Galatians 4, verse 7, we read, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. In John 14, 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I will go and prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you might be also. The second coming. Jesus is coming back. We know that he lived. And the scriptures are some of the most important attestations of the truth. Because there are no other documents that are as old or close to the events that they describe as those books of the Bible, particularly the New Testament. It's what makes us Adventists. But there is more. In Revelation 1, verse 6, we read, And he hath made us kings and priests. 
Now, I'm not going to ask whether any of you wish that you were part of the royal family in Great Britain. You probably don't. There's a lot of dysfunction there. There's a lot of strange things that take place. But what would it be like to have the kind of wealth that they have? You know, they're the wealthiest, about the wealthiest people in the world. We're going to be made kings and queens. It can't get any better than that. Everything that anybody could have dreamed of, anything that anybody could have imagined, anything that was worth knowing, believing, or experiencing, God has prepared all that for us. So much that when the Apostle Paul was taken in vision, talked about it, talked about a man who was in, in a, and who was out of his body, it was a vision. That's what it was. And when he was asked about what he saw, he said, I have not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for us. He didn't even try. I mean, he was, he was lost when he was there, and I'm sure that it was a microcosm of what God really had and has for each and every one of us. One day, Rabbi... Baruch's grandson, Yehel, was playing hide-and-seek with another boy. He hid himself well and waited for his playmate to find him. After 20 minutes, he peeked out of his secret hiding place and saw no one and pulled his head back inside. After waiting a very long time, he came out of his hiding place, but the other boy was nowhere to be seen anywhere. Then Yehel realized that his playmate had not looked for him from the very beginning. Crying, he ran to his grandfather and complained of his faithless friend. Tears brimmed in Rabbi Baruch's eyes as he realized God says the same thing. No one wants to seek me. Like the rabbi, we understand that many dismiss that we owe it that at all. Even the lost, the lives they live in selfish indulgence and material gain, only live because the Savior loves them too. And on the cross, earned probation to spend as they wished. Notice in the miracle, and I'm sure that you know the story, Jesus came across ten lepers. And they cried out, Master, have mercy on us. They had leprosy, which was incurable at the time, very easily incurable today. Very incurable, and it was considered by the Pharisees to be the greatest. You would have had to be the worst sinner to have that come upon you. And so he directed them to go to the priest because that's what you had to do. If you proved that you were, you didn't have the disease anymore, they would acknowledge you and let you back into polite society again. But there was one who turned back. And he came to the Lord and he thanked him with all of his heart and he knelt at his feet. And Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. And then Jesus said this, probably to his disciples, because Jesus wasn't off on his own. Most of the time, he had his friends with him. He said, were there not ten cleansed? And only one thanked me. Is God hurt by those that reject him? Yes, he is. God is a person. He's not human, but he is a person. He has feelings that are as strong as his power and his glory. God aches for the lost of this world. In the, this is the thing. This is the point. For, but in the, in the miracle, as in so many encounters, 
It is the unbelievers that become believers. And the ungrateful believers who are unmasked as unbelievers. Jesus' experience in the Gospels with the leaders of Israel shows that it was almost epidemic. We owe him everything. Our life, our laws, our forgiveness of sin, and our inheritance at last. And I can't wait. I wonder how many of you would like to raise your hand with mine to thank God for he has everything that we need. Because he is everything that we need. And without him, our hearts are lonely and desperate and destitute. And I just want to raise my hand to bless him for all things. Father in heaven, how can we tell you how much we love you? Help us, really, Lord, to return that love in ways that are meaningful to you. We know that we're sinners, not by choice, but by habit. And we know that you can make us righteous, that you can put your blood in the place of our sin and wipe it out. And that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you help us in our character to be a little bit more like you. We love you, Lord. Thank you.